Suicide of the West. An Essay on the Meaning and Destiny of Liberalism. James Burnham. Chapter 4, The Universal Dialogue. Inside the liberal system of ideas, we have so far found, human nature is changing and plastic, with an indefinitely large potential for progressive development. Through reason, freed from superstition, authority, custom and tradition, human beings can discover the truth and the road toward the betterment of society. There is nothing inherent in human nature that prevents the attainment of peace, freedom, justice and well-being, of, that is, the good society. The obstacles are ignorance and faulty social institutions. Because both these obstacles are extrinsic and remediable, historical optimism is justified. Social problems can be solved, the good society can be achieved, or at any rate approximated. Let us proceed to the liberal beliefs that explain the means and the rules by which the progress that is possible will be brought about in practice. 6. In order to get rid of the ignorance that is one of the two factors blocking progress toward the good society, what is needed, and the only thing needed, is universal, rationally grounded education. It was Maximilien de Robespierre, leader of the Jacobin Club, who, in the midst of the terror, as it happened, put forward the first law, modeled on a project of Condorcet's, instituting a system of free, that is, state-financed, universal education. This has been an inviolate article of the liberal creed ever since, and obviously must be, for it follows with syllogistic simplicity from the other liberal principles. We should stop to note that there is implicit here a particular view of education that is not the only view. By liberal principles strictly applied, the specific function of education is to overcome ignorance, and ignorance is overcome by, and only by, acquiring rational, scientific knowledge. All the myriad beliefs within the range that liberalism regards as non-rational or irrational, as the debris of superstition, prejudice, intuition, habit and custom, would be admitted to the curriculum only as miscellaneous data to be studied objectively by psychology, history, anthropology and the social sciences, and so, too, religion, or rather, religions. As Lord Russell and John Stuart Mill so unconditionally assert in the quotations given at the end of the last chapter, the purpose of genuine education as understood by liberalism is, precisely, to liberate the mind from the crippling hold of custom and all non-rational belief. For liberalism, the direct purpose of education cannot be to produce a good citizen, to lead toward holiness or salvation, to inculcate a nation's, a creed's or a race's traditions, habits and ceremonies, or anything of that sort. Nor is there any need that it should be, for the logic of liberalism assures us that, given the right sort of education, that is, rational education, the pupil, in whose nature there is no innate and permanent defect or corruption, will necessarily become the good citizen, and, with the right sort of education universalized, the good citizens together will produce the good society. The child, for liberalism, approaches the altar of education, for the school is, in truth, liberalism's church, in all his spiritual nakedness as a purely rational, or embryonically rational, being, shorn of color, creed, race, family and nationality, the universal student before the universal teacher, reason. This is the conception, gradually crystallized out of the logic of liberalism, that makes intelligible the liberal position on the multitudinous educational issues that are presently of so much public concern in the United States, and on the typical educational programs that are put forward for the new and underdeveloped nations. 7. In order to get rid of the bad institutions that constitute the second of the two obstacles to progress, what is needed, along with education, is democratic reform, political, economic and social. Properly educated, and functioning within a framework of democratic institutions, human beings will understand their true interests, which are peace, freedom, justice, cooperation and material well-being, and will be able to achieve them. Bertrand Russell summed up this encouraging outlook in another of his essays, called The World as It Could Be Made, originally published as part of a book entitled Proposed Roads to Freedom, the two titles are themselves unmistakable symptoms from the liberal syndrome. Men, he wrote, are beset by three types of evil, from physical nature, death, pain, tough soil, from character, chiefly ignorance, from power. The main methods of combating these evils are. And I now quote his words directly. 
Four physical evils, science, four evils of character, that is, four ignorance, education, four evils of power, the reform of the political and economic organization of society. But I want to stress especially the words of a spokesman still more significant for the liberalism of present-day America. Robert Maynard Hutchins is intelligent, learned and eloquent in his own person. Though he has been a liberal all his public life, his liberalism is not excessively doctrinaire and sectarian, except perhaps on the matter of free speech. In his ideas about the content of education Mr. Hutchins has deviated from liberal orthodoxy, in particular when, on revising a university curriculum, he treated pre-Renaissance philosophy as not merely a historical artifact but part of rational knowledge, and therefore part of what would help overcome ignorance. Mr. Hutchins has reflected carefully on the meaning of the doctrines he believes, not just picked them off the ideological shelf. Our society has marked his eminence by the high posts, many distinctions and abundant publicity it has bestowed on him, and the large sums of money it has placed at his disposal. After his years as head of the Rockefeller Endowed University of Chicago, he directed the Ford Endowed Fund for the Republic, and has more lately shifted his primary attention to an offshoot of the fund that has become something of a magnet for liberal fundamentalists, the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, tax-exempt, of course, like the parent fund, its parent, the Ford Foundation, and the university. The Center, both funds and the University of Chicago are all among our active and influential opinion-forming institutions. The voice of Mr. Hutchins is not that of a prophet crying in the wilderness, it is more nearly that of a herald proclaiming the sovereign's will. On January 21, 1959, Mr. Hutchins received, with due ceremony, the Sidney Hillman Award for Meritorious Public Service. As so often, the very name is symptomatic, honoring the career of a member of a minority that is the classic target of discrimination, who achieved fame first by building one of the major organizations of the advancing labor movement and then by becoming integrated into the power structure of the Rooseveltian New Deal, the regime that marked the rise of the liberal ideology to national predominance. On the occasion of this award, Mr. Hutchins delivered an address that is a condensation of much of the theoretical side of the liberal ideology. He called it, is democracy possible? Meaning by, democracy, what we are calling, liberalism. Let me quote from that address a few sentences that bear on the seven symptoms that I have so far listed, very directly on the last two. I shall return to it later on. The democratic, i.e., liberal, faith is faith in man, faith in every man, faith that men, if they are well enough educated and well enough informed, can solve the problems raised by their own aggregation. Mr. Hutchins then added a comment admitting with surprising candor that liberalism is not a scientific theory nor a cognitive assertion of any kind, and is immune to fact, observation, or experience. One advantage of this faith is that it is practically shock-proof. He went on. Industrialization can sweep the world. Nationalism and technology can threaten the extinction of the human race. Population can break out all over. Man can take off from this planet as his ancestors took off from the primordial ooze and try to make other planets to shoot from. Education can be trivialized beyond belief. The media of communication can be turned into media of entertainment. The democratic dialogue made possible by the right of free speech can almost stop because people have nothing to say, or, if they have something to say, no place to say it. And still it is possible to believe that if democracy and the dialogue can continue, if they can be expanded, freedom, justice, equality, and peace will ultimately be achieved. I cannot forbear taking a moment to taste the irony of this moving declaration of faith. The doctrine that begins by proclaiming its emancipation from all prejudice, superstition and dogma, from all beliefs sanctioned by time, habit and tradition, that opens up every question to free inquiry by every questing mind that declares its total readiness to follow reason, science and truth wherever they may beckon, it is this doctrine that, we discover at last, is so fixed and absolute that no possible happening now or in any conceivable future could trouble its eternal certainty by so much as a surface tremor. Still, Mr. Hutchins is not willing merely to anchor his ship to so secure a rock and rest his oars. Over and over again, he tells us how much educating there is still to be done. If our hopes of democracy are to be realized, every citizen of this country 
Everyone, note. Is going to have to be educated to the limit of his capacity. It is tiresome to harp on details of language, but surely there must be some significance in the fact that ideologues use words so imprecisely. Anybody in his right mind knows after an instant's reflection that every citizen of this country is not going to be educated to the limit of his capacity, ever, that, in fact, very few citizens, in the best of cases, will ever be educated to that limit, which, according to the psychologists, is rather formidable. Now it follows from the logic of Mr. Hutchins' assertion that if even one single citizen is not educated to the limit of his capacity, then our hopes for democracy are not going to be realized. The only possible conclusion is that these must be pretty silly hopes. And toward the end of his address, Mr. Hutchins is drawn irresistibly to the problem of tradition, which we have found to be so critical. Today, he finds, the democratic dialogue, education and therefore progress, are impeded by obsolescent practices and institutions from the long ballot to the presidential primary, from the electoral college to the organization of cities, counties and states. The political anatomy is full of vermiform appendices, many of them, like Arkansas. Mr. Hutchins was speaking after the Little Rock episode. Inflamed. One thing is certain, and that is that if our hopes of democracy are to be realized, the next generation is in for a job of institutional remodeling the like of which has not been seen since the Founding Fathers. 8. According to the doctrine we have reviewed, what liberalism notices as the evils of society, crime, delinquency, war, hunger, unemployment, communism, if this is judged an evil, urban blight, etc., are the results of ignorance and faulty social institutions or arrangements. The effective method for getting rid of the evils is therefore to eliminate the ignorance, by education, and to reform the institutions. It follows as a corollary that we have no rational basis for blaming criminals for their crimes, teenagers for their muggings and rumbles, soldiers for wars, the poor of India or Egypt for their hunger, the non-working for their joblessness, the city dwellers for the decay of their city, or the Communist Party for communism. They cannot be blamed for being ignorant, for not having been given a proper education, nor for the faulty institutions into which they were born. Since no one is to blame, except society, with her shady past, there is no ground for a retributive theory of punishment, for vengeance, as liberals call it. Our aim in the treatment of delinquents, criminals, soldiers and communists must be to educate, or re-educate, them into good, that is liberal, citizens, and meanwhile to improve the bad conditions, slums, poverty, lack of schoolrooms, lack of democracy, that produced them. These conceptions lead quite naturally to what we may describe as a permissive attitude toward erring members of the community, particularly when they belong to racial, religious, caste or economic groups less privileged than the general average, i.e., suffering more, as liberalism would explain it, from the faulty arrangements, and to a social service mentality. Eleanor Roosevelt was a supreme example of both this attitude and this mentality. Time and again her newspaper column offered the kindest of sociological explanations for the derelictions of some poor devil, rather, some poor victim, who had run afoul of a parole officer, congressional committee, southern sheriff or northern court. And in her descriptive prose, the entire globe was spread out like a gigantic slum eagerly awaiting the visit of an international legion of caseworkers, a vision which, as things have been developing in recent years, proves to have been by no means an idle fancy. These same ideas underlie the liberal approach to the Cold War, underdeveloped countries, the world communist enterprise and international relations more generally, as we shall consider in another context later on. Communism, dictatorship, Mao Mao and other political badnesses are explained as the results of hunger and poverty. Foreign aid plus democratic reforms, the equation was made explicit in the program for the Alliance for Progress, will bring a rise in the standard of living which will in turn do away with the tendencies toward tyranny, aggression and war. In fact, a higher standard of living is going to transform the Soviet Union itself into a satisfied and peaceful country, as Professor Walt Whitman Rostow, who was President Kennedy's selection to head the State Department's policy planning staff, has proved by an elaborate liberal sorites in his very influential book, Stages of Growth. 
The yearly programs of Americans for Democratic Action are at pains to protest that our real enemies are not wicked people or nations or creeds, and certainly not the Soviet Union or communism, but hunger and racial discrimination, the real war is the war against want. It must be confessed, however, that the point of view of liberalism in this respect is not wholly consistent. If ignorance and bad social arrangements explain crime, war, hunger, racial riots, urban blight and so on, and thereby relieve the individual mugger, soldier, jobless adult, berserk negro and unwed mother of direct responsibility for their behavior and its consequences, then the well-to-do citizen who gets mugged, the generals, landlords, merchants, bankers and even white segregationists ought also, by the same logic, to be relieved of their burden of personal guilt, they too, in their own manner, are merely unfortunate products of the bad conditions into which they were born and the inadequate education they received. But liberal rhetoric has a difficult time adjusting to this even balance, and does tend to scold bankers, professional soldiers, corporation heads, oil millionaires, southern governors, Nazis and British diplomats rather more sternly than Negro delinquents, strikers who beat up violators of a picket line, anti-H-bomb rioters, communists or natives of a new nation smashing the windows of a British or American consulate. The divergence here is a rather crucial one, to which I shall return at greater length. 9. How is society to carry on the educational process that is to overcome ignorance and thereby assure progress, peace, justice and well-being? Education must be, in Mr. Hutchins' words, a universal dialogue, and in a double sense. Not only must everyone be educated, there must also be a universal and absolute freedom of opinion in the schoolroom above a certain academic level, and considerable freedom at all levels, there must be academic freedom, as we usually refer to it. The claims of reason will permit nothing less, and nothing else than reason has any claim in the premises. Every teacher, or at any rate every university teacher, and in the last analysis, every pupil, has the right to put forward his point of view, which after all may be the true one, however unpopular at the moment, in the free forum of ideas reason will freely pick and choose. Any interference with academic freedom is reactionary, and a break on the continuous process of dispelling the ignorance that blocks progress. In the United States this principle is the special province of the American Association of University Professors, the trade association charged not only with refining the theoretical content of academic freedom but with applying it to the disputes that from time to time arise in the colleges, as well as to such public matters as McCarthyism, the Fifth Amendment, loyalty oaths and censorship. 10. But politics, as defined by the categories of liberalism, is simply education generalized, a school in which all voters and indeed all of mankind are the pupils. Politics too must be thought of as a universal dialogue. Academic freedom in the schools is merely a special application of the more general principles of freedom of opinion and free speech in society at large. The ideal of The faith in which I was brought up Mr. Hutchins reports in the address from which I have quoted was the civilization of the dialogue, where everybody talked with everybody else about everything, where everybody was content to abide by the decision of the majority as long as the dialogue could continue. In this view the great crime is to prevent other people from speaking up, or to say that there are certain things you won't talk about, or certain people you won't talk to, either at home or abroad. This is the conception of absolute, or nearly absolute, free speech, presaged though not quite driven to totality by John Stuart Mill, that is upheld in current theory by writers like Zechariah Chaffee and Henry S. Commager, and almost all the sharper critics of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, that is to say, among others, most university professors. It is defended in practice by the American Civil Liberties Union and, in recent years, by the Supreme Court, in particular by the Chief Justice and Justices Hugo Black and William O. Douglas. Justice Black, indeed, extended the doctrine to entirely new ground as late as 1962 when, in a speech widely reported in the press, he stated his personal wish for the abolition of all legal restraints not only on any sort of political, religious, moral and sexual utterance, which is a routine position, but on slander, libel and misrepresentation. Of all civil liberties. 
Professor Shapiro notes in a comparative estimate that perhaps holds more generally for his own older than for the newer, liberal generation. The most prized has been liberty of thought and expression. Liberals came to the deep conviction that all opinions, even erroneous ones, should have freedom of expression. The point could not be made much more strongly than by John Stuart Mill's famous dictum. If all mankind minus one were of one opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. 11. If we know the truth, we might reasonably ask, why waste society's time, space and money giving an equal forum, under the free speech rule, to error? The only consistent answer is, we cannot be certain that we know the truth, if, indeed, there is any such thing as objective truth. Liberalism is logically committed to the doctrine that philosophers know under the forbidding title of epistemological relativism. This comes out clearly both in theoretical discussion by philosophers of liberalism and in liberal practice. We confront here a principle that would seem strangely paradoxical if it had not become so familiar in the thought and writings of our time. Liberalism is committed to the truth and to the belief that truth is what is discovered by reason in the sciences, and committed against the falsehoods and errors that are handed down by superstition, prejudice, custom and authority. But every man, according to liberalism, is entitled to his own opinion, and has the right to express it, and to advocate its acceptance. In motivating the theory and practice of free speech, liberalism must either abandon its belief in the superior social utility of truth, or maintain that we cannot be sure we know the truth. The first alternative, which would imply that error is sometimes more useful for society than the truth, is by no means self-evidently false, but is ruled out, or rather not even considered seriously, by liberalism. Therefore liberalism must accept the second alternative. We thus face the following situation. Truth is our goal, but objective truth, if it exists at all, is unattainable, we cannot be sure even whether we are getting closer to it, because that estimate could not be made without an objective standard against which to measure the gap. Thus the goal we have postulated becomes meaningless, evaporates. Our original commitment to truth undergoes a subtle transformation, and becomes a commitment to the rational and scientific process itself, to, in John Dewey's terminology, the method of inquiry. But this process or method of inquiry is nothing other than the universal dialogue made possible by universal education and universal suffrage under the rules of freedom of opinion, speech, press and assembly. Throughout his long life, the commitment to the method of inquiry that is at once the scientific method and the democratic method was perhaps the major theme of Dewey's teaching. Let us add that truth thus becomes in practice relative to the method of inquiry. For all practical purposes, truth in any specific scientific field is simply the present consensus of scientific opinion within that same field, and political and social truth is what is voted by a democratic majority. It is not clear in advance how wide the field of political and social truth should be understood to be, presumably that question too can be answered only by the democratic method, so that the field is as wide as the democratic majority chooses to make it. The plainest summary of the net conclusion of the liberal doctrine of truth is that given in Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' aphorism. He conjoins the two key propositions, though I place them here in a sequence the reverse of the original, one. Truth is the only ground upon which, men's, wishes safely can be carried out. Two. The best test of truth is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. Another of the prominent American philosophers of liberalism, Professor T. V. Smith of the University of Chicago, whose influence has been spread much beyond the academies by virtue of his mellifluous prose style and his popularity as an after-dinner speaker, has made the idea of relativity the core of his essay on philosophy in democracy. This inability finally to distinguish truth from falsity, good from evil, beauty from ugliness, is the propagutic for promotion from animal impetuosity to civilized forbearance. It marks the firmest foundation. Again the paradox is near the surface. For the tolerance which is characteristic of democracy alone. Professor Smith very rightly cites Justice Holmes as a major source of the influence of this doctrine of relativism among us. As Holmes put it, we lack a knowledge of the truth of truth. 
Professor Smith attacks all of the classical theories of objective truth, and declares. No one of these theories can adequately test itself, much less anything else. The idea of objective truth is only the rationalization of private, subjective. Feelings of certitude, and certitude is not enough. It more easily marks the beginning of coercion than the end of demonstration. The only insurance the modern world has against the recurrence of the age-old debacle of persecution for opinion is the presence in it of a sufficient number of men of such character as will mollify assertions of truth with the restraints of tolerance. Since final truth cannot be known, we must keep the dialogue eternally going, and, where action is required, be content. Mr. Hutchins echoes Justice Holmes. To abide by the decision of the majority.